church service today and let the hearts of the people be ready to receive what you would have them hear. God, I know that you have a word for us, that you're trying to let us know about your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago, I started out with um, what I was studying, a word study on, I guess, on Exodus 34 and verse 6, and I started out with compassion, and I decided that uh, we would keep going with this series. So today's topic will be on gracious. And we've been studying the use of the words in the, in the original language, so in the Hebrew, and then for the New Testament in the Greek. And the original Hebrew word for gracious or compassion was in the Rahem family, and, or words that are related to compassion, which were rahum, rahamim, and raham. Um, I, was, I was trying to go over the words with my husband and to see if, you know, how awful I sounded trying to pronounce these words. And I said, you're supposed to say it with like a little bit more spittiness in it, but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to gross you guys out with my sounds. So <laughs> know that they are not being said Correctly, I did have someone who was very kind and tried to teach me um, how to properly say them the last time I taught, and I was, I'm just going to leave that to the professionals. So the word occurs in Exodus 34 and 6 as the adjective for rahum, meaning compassion. But what's really interesting is that in this description of compassion, it's also linked with gracious, which is kanun. And this isn't the exception. Of the 13 times that compassion is used in the original Hebrew, 11 of those times are used with the word gracious. And most often, the order is gracious and compassionate. We see that in Joel 2, Jonah 4, Psalms 111, 112, 145, Nehemiah 9, and 2 Chronicles 30. Three times that are most notably found, though, are the first times that the order is compassionate and gracious. And we see that in the theme verse of Exodus 34 and 6, Psalms 86 and 103. But seven of the times that it's, it's used out of the 11, they also add slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. One verse in Psalms 86 and 15 also adds truth and Um, Two of those places in Joel and Jonah, they also add relenting of evil. So most most often than not, the context surrounding these verses where they are talking about God's compassion or God's grace is around the people's failure, how Israel failed, the whole golden calf scenario. But this reminder that God is compassionate serves to compel Israel, God's people, to turn back to him. The Bible says that his kindness leads us to repentance. And God over and over again reminds the children of Israel of his compassion and his grace so that they will come back to him. Psalms 103, 8-9 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, he will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Second Chronicles 30 and 9. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and sons will find compassion before those who led them captive and will return to the land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate and will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. Nehemiah 9.31 says, Nevertheless, in your great compassion, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. For you are gracious and you are a gracious and compassionate God. Psalms eighty six fifteen says other times these characteristics are simply praised as lovely. But you, O Lord, are a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and ab- abundant in loving kindness and truth. Psalms one eleven and four, He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. And I just love. How many different writers in different time periods repeat the same truth over and over again, that God is gracious and compassionate? The adjective compassionate, or rahum, is most often used in verses that are looking back to Exodus 34, 6-7, where God tells them that he will not destroy them for 
their betrayal or their sin against him. And in this context that are similar to it, that everyone else is referring to this verse, is around the people failing and God responding with compassion and grace. Compassionate and gracious are often used in parallel or as synonyms describing, synonyms, yeah, I said that right, describing God's care for his people. Grace is like receiving a gift. Grace is receiving a gift. Have you ever felt awkward when you received a gift from someone? And what I mean by that is not awkward as in, oh, wow, someone gave me a gift. That's weird. It's awkward as in you feel awkward because maybe the gift was too generous or too amazing, and you felt like, oh, I can't, I can't accept that. I can't receive that. Like, I'm not worthy of something so generous or kind. So we try to decline, and we say, no, 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 I couldn't. Because sometimes when people give you a large gift, especially that you're not expecting of some sort, or extends kindness that you don't deserve, it's kind of like overwhelmingly humbling, isn't it? And I have felt this very way and have been completely overwhelmed and humbled by the kindness and generosity shown to me personally and to my family, especially by the people in this church, and I'm not just saying that to get you to like me, which I hope you do, but honestly, I have been overwhelmed by the kindness and love shown to our family here over the years, and it has astounded me because there were times where we were blessed by people, and we truly felt like this is too generous. We are undeserving. Why would you do something like this? And it left us speechless and unable to properly say thank you because sometimes when something seems so extravagant to you, thank you doesn't really seem like enough. And yet the person giving, that's all they want. And a lot of times not even looking for it, but they give out of the abundance of their love and kindness and don't want you to decline the free gift that they're trying to give you. Um, but we sometimes treat God's grace the same way. Sometimes we have a hard time accepting it. We feel like we don't deserve it. It's too wonderful to receive after everything that I've done. We are too unworthy. It's too generous. And saying thank you hardly seems like enough at times. Uh, I have a quick video if it downloaded properly. If you try to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently describe God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at the second key word in this statement, Gracious. The Hebrew word is chanun, which is related to the Hebrew noun chen. This word chen is often translated as grace or favor, and if you study how this word is used throughout the Bible, you find a fascinating story. One meaning of chen is delightful or favorable. In the Psalms, a skilled poet is said to have lips of chen, that is, he can craft beautiful words that bring delight. Or a dazzling piece of jewelry is an ornament of chen. It attracts attention and favor. This is why chen is often the word used to describe a gift given with delight or favor. In these cases, chen could be translated as grace. Like in the story of Esther, who approaches the king of Persia to ask that she and her people be spared from death. She calls this a request for chen. And because the king delights in Esther, he favors her and grants her wish. So, giving a gift of favor is chen because it's motivated by delight. And the most extreme kind of chen is showing favor to someone who should get what they deserve, not a generous gift. Like Jacob, who cheated his brother Esau, ran away, and then after 20 years wants to come back and make things right. So, he comes to Esau asking, may I find chen in your eyes? Jacob isn't asking for what is fair, but for favor. And surprisingly, that's what Esau gives him. He chooses to delight in his brother Jacob and show him grace that he doesn't deserve. 
Now, Chen requires a generous spirit, which people sometimes have. But in the Bible, the one who shows more Chen than anyone else is God. Like when God rescued the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and they quickly betray him by giving their allegiance to a golden idol as their God. But then Moses steps in and asks God to consider giving a gift that they don't deserve. And God says yes, by showing the ultimate act of chen, forgiveness and a promise to be with these people. This character trait of God is so reliable that over 40 times in the book of Psalms, people cry out for God's chen when they're sick or in danger or when the Israelites are in exile. And the biblical prophets like Isaiah looked back to God's chen in the past and boldly declared that God will one day show chen to his people by delivering them and all creation from death and ruin. Now, when we turn to the authors of the New Testament, they describe God's chen with the Greek word charis, which means gracious gift. Like when we're introduced to Jesus in the Gospel of John, we're told that Jesus is God's glorious charis become human, sent into a world of people trapped in darkness and death. Because according to the Apostle Paul, we're like the living dead. God has handed humanity over to the destructive consequences of our selfish decisions. But, Paul says, God is rich in mercy, and by his charis, he's rescued us. He's talking about how Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are offered to us as a generous gift of life that is more powerful than death. And as with any gift, all one has to do is receive it. So now you can see why the biblical authors talk so much about this description of God's character throughout the Bible. When people are willing to own their failures and ask God for chen, he has a consistent and generous response. God gives the gift of himself, his life and his love. This is what it means that God is gracious. The Hebrew word kanun, am I saying it right, brother? Slightly close at all? <laughs> um, but the Hebrew word for kanan, meaning gracious, is from the root kanan. And this word for chen is, has a few different meanings and context within the Bible. It's important to understand that these repetitions to get a better understanding of what it means for God to truly call himself gracious. This word is used in the Bible to mean elegant, charming, or inducing a response of favor. As the video said, a poet crafts words in an elegant and beautiful way and are said to have lips of grace or lips of chen. And Psalms 45 and 2 says, You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Proverbs 22 and 11 says, The one who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. The focus for the word is not so much on the inherent beauty or elegance of an object, like a a necklace or something beautiful, but on the perception of beauty and the charm that is in the eyes of the observer. So this word refers to something that is perceived as valuable and therefore it generates a favorable response. It can also be used to mean show favor and generosity and the implication is also that favor is shown regardless of obligation or consideration of worth. And the verb, kanan, is used to describe acts of generosity and favor, and it can be used in the context of someone requesting favor or showing favor to someone else. And the idea of this social status is crucial in the meaning of the word kanan. It always describes a favorable, favorable response from a superior to someone of a lower social status. And in the book of Esther, as we saw, Esther goes before the king to seek favor from him, to ask that he would spare her people despite the destruction in the decree. And Esther is a subordinate making a request to a superior who not only, he is not obligated to grant her her request or even listen to her, but he does. So the king shows Esther favor. 
Esther 4 and 8, he, Mordecai, her uncle, also gave him a copy of the text of the edict which had been used in Susa for their destruction that he might show Esther and inform her and to order her to go to the king to request his, his favor and to plead with him for her people. Verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 3 says, Then Esther spoke again to the king, fell at his feet, wept, and requested his favor to avert the evil scheme that Haman um, and his plot, which he had advised, devised against the Jews. In the book of Genesis, we read about the story of Joseph and his brothers and how they betray him and they throw him in a pit for slavery. And when they threw their brother into a pit, he begged them to show him favor or show grace to forgive his arrogance and not to sell him into slavery. Um, Genesis 42, 21 says, Then they said to one another, Truly, we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he begged for favor, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And we see this use again in the book of Proverbs in the description of someone showing favor towards a person of a lesser status. Proverbs 14 and 31 says, The one who oppresses the poor insults his maker, but the one who shows generosity to the needy honors him. And the Bible talks about to find favor in your eyes. It uses that verse or that phrase quite a few times. And the most often that this Grace, the word for grace in the original language appears within the, fa with, within the phrase of let me find favor in your eyes, and it's used 47 times. Genesis 39 and 4 says, he found favor in the eyes, it's talking about Joseph, he found favor in the eyes of Potiphar and became his personal attendant, and he was appointed over the entire house and everything belonged to Potiphar. We jump over to the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 10, then she fell on her face bestowing to the ground and uh, bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And this is talking about um, a Moabite widow who was of very low status approaching Boaz who was uh, rich and of high status. And he shows favor to her because she found favor in his eyes. In each occurrence of this phrase, the person is in a vulnerable or subordinate position and is given a gift of favor or kindness from a person of higher status. I'm not sure if you're picking up on the theme, but we are subordinate to a king who often shows us a whole lot of favor when he is not obligated to, but yet we find favor in his eyes. And this gift is given re without regard of one's worth or status and without any sense of obligation. And sometimes the favor requested isn't simply given regardless of someone's worth, but despite of their lack of worth. Genesis 30 and 27, but Laban said to him, speaking of Jacob, if I have found favor in your eyes, stay with me. I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. So Laban doesn't want Jacob to leave because he's like, hey, I'm being blessed and prosperous because you're here. It had nothing to do with Laban's goodness. But God blessed him despite of his lack of worth because of his love for Jacob. Genesis 33 and 8, and he said, what do you mean by all this company which I have met? And he said, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. And this is talking about when Jacob reunites with Esau, the brother that he cheated, and sends him gifts. He sends animals ahead asking for a gift of favor. He does not want his brother to retaliate on him after all these years and kill him, was basically the storyline here. And he's sending him gifts, and he's asking for a gift in return. Please forgive me. And in both of these cases, a person who has wronged and cheated another is asking for this gift. Please give me grace. Generally, these words are descript um, descriptive of generous actions that are freely offered or received and contribute to the well-being of another or to the health of an ongoing relationship. It's an active kindness and generosity exhibited, particularly towards those in need. And some other examples we find in Proverbs 28 and 8, where they're aiding the poor. Deuteronomy 28 and 50, we, we find this when they're assisting the young or the old. 
showing compassion for those who suffer. We see that in Job 19. And who those who are oppressed, we see it in Daniel, the same use for grace. And it is assumed that, so when they're giving these instructions, it's assumed that this is not going to be a one-time thing. God expects it to become a regular part of our life to extend grace to others because we have been extended grace. These actions are not only pleasing to God, but are considered to be done unto himself, he says in the, two, in the New Testament, and they carry their own reward. Jesus says, when you do to the least of these, when you do to someone else, you're also doing unto me. Human acts of favor account for about one-third of the use of this verb or this word um, for gracious in Hebrew. But the majority of the occurrences that are described acts of God's generous favor are shown towards his people is obviously the two-thirds of the Bible. So the first person that God shows this grace to, or this chen, is to Noah. He notices Noah's righteous living and spares him from the punishment that God was pouring out on all of humanity, which was the great flood. Genesis 6, 5 to 8, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace, or Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And he spared him, and we know that we are here because of this grace that Noah gave, or God gave to Noah, and they were able to repopulate the world. And later in Genesis, Jacob tells Esau that God has shown him generous favor despite the many times that Jacob has failed. And in this moment, Jacob is giving that same generous gift to Esau that we spoke of so that Esau will show favor, show grace to him, despite the fact that he really didn't deserve it. He done him wrong. Genesis 33 and 11 says, Please take my gift, which has been brought to you, because God has shown me generous favor, and because I have plenty. Thus he urged him, and he took it. Oh, because he was doing the whole, oh, no, 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 I don't need this. And he's like, no, no, please take it. Um, I'm really bad for that when someone tries to bless me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I had pastor once tell me before, he says, you're insulting them. You're robbing them of a blessing. You also are blessed when you bless someone else. So if someone's trying to bless you, you can graciously accept. Um, because it's a blessing to them. Because God takes notice of every cup of water that you give in his name. All right. The best example of God showing undeserved favor is in the golden calf story, which we looked at a little closer in the last lesson um, in Exodus chapter 34. So the people break the very first two commandments that God gave immediately. No other gods, don't worship other gods, and do not make idols. Right after making those commandments and giving them, Moses comes down to find the people breaking the first two commandments. And it's like telling your child, don't do that, and they do that. And then you're like, oh, just me. Everyone's more patient than they are. Not me. I am not a nice mom. And actually, it's, it's funny because I don't know why I'm off my notes and this could be dangerous. But I, I have this thing about me where... I tend to look, I don't know if it's like upbringing or what, I don't know. I'm going to blame it on myself anyways. I, th I tend to beat up on myself more than I forgive myself. I tend to think that people are angry with me more than they're happy with me. And it's just my mindset. And I transfer that in my relationship with God. But God is not like anyone here. He is far above and far different than our human capacity. So I was praying one day, you know, being all mopey and eory -E like I usually am. And I was like, God, like, I just, I'm such a failure. I can't do anything right. I like, I don't know why you, you forgive me over and over. I don't deserve it. I don't feel like I can accept your forgiveness, the whole bit. And I was like, Lord, I keep hearing and keep reading and keep teaching, which is like, 
such a hypocrite. Because teaching about God's grace and forgiveness, and here I'm like, oh, Lord, uh, you don't forgive me, though. Like, yeah, everyone else it's great for, but when it comes to me, I'm like, I can't, I can't take it. And I was like, Lord, I, I want to believe what your word says. Help me to believe and truly grasp it for me. I 100% believe it for everyone else. But when it came to me, I had a really hard time with it. And I was like, can you, could you just show me who you are? Help me to really understand who you are. And that's when I felt to study his compassion. And I would, I would get angry at my kids and be the monster mom, the momster. And then I, I would get convicted. And I would feel this feeling of, well, I know it was God whispering in my soul. And he would remind me, they're just innocent children. They're just innocent children. I'm like, yeah, but they keep messing up, and I keep repeating myself. And he kept reminding me, yes, but they are flawed, innocent children, just like you are my flawed, innocent child. And his mercy and grace and compassion filled me in a way that every time I would get angry at my kids but then remember how much I love them, God was reminding me, it's no different with me and you. Sure, there are things that you might do that might irk me. Yeah, he didn't say this. <laughs> but, like, I'm sure there are things that I do that irk the Lord. And he's like, you know better. Sorry, Dad. But then he's like, but my love for you covers all of that. It doesn't change how I feel about you. And that led me into this study that I came upon. And I really started looking into those words, and I was like, I see it. I see it, and I need to tell the world about his grace and compassion. So that's where we are here. So, okay, move along. Anyways, I don't know why I felt to share that, but I did. Or maybe I just did it out of not being wise. I'm not sure. But God tells Moses after this whole, they broke the first two commandments right away, and he tells them, I'm done with these people. <laughs> I'm done with these kids. <laughs> that's me at home. And he says, I'm done with these people. They're going to keep doing this. And he's going to leave them, and he's not going to go forward with them to the promised land. He, he says, you guys can go without my presence. So Moses shatters the tables of the Ten Commandments, and in his anger and rage, he grinds it up into powder and makes the people drink it. And um, I was like, I was telling my husband about this, and I was like, should I say that? He's like, well, it's in the Bible. <laughs> but then he goes back up to the mountain to God, five more times to intercede on the people's behalf and have conversation with God. And at one point, Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not bring us up from this place, talking about Mount Sinai. For how then can I know that I have found favor in your eyes and I and your people? Isn't it by your going with us that I and your people are marked as distinct from all of the other people on the face of the land? And God responds with, I will do this thing that you have asked, because that's how loving he is, because you have found favor in my eyes, he says to Moses. Or in other words, he says, I am extending my grace to you. He cools off way faster than I do. I'm all one of these, like, no, don't let it go. Hold it on to it and let it fester and boil inside. No. My husband, he's so gracious. We can be bickering about something and, like, as soon as we're done, he's moved on. He's like, oh, and all happy. And I'm like, why are you all happy? Right now, we're mad at each other. And he's like, oh, we are. I'm sorry. Like, he is so forgiving. He reminds me of how forgiving God is, and I am not. I'm working on it. So God ends up recommitting to the people and renewing the covenant that they had just broke, and he appears to Moses saying, this is when he comes in with that verse of Exodus 34 and 6. Right after Israel completely defies everything, he says to Moses, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord proclaimed, The Lord, Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He says, Moses, I know you guys messed up. But I am compassionate, and I am gracious, and I am patient, and it takes a lot for me to get angry. But above all that, I'm abundant in goodness and truth. 
He is the giver of generous favor to people, even when they don't deserve it, when they deserve the opposite. And this character trait of God in Exodus 32 all the way through 34 becomes foundational for all of God's future interactions with Israel, and we are the spiritual Israel. So that even goes on to us. In Psalms, there are frequent requests for God to show his favor or grace and deliver the psalmist, those who are writing it, from difficulty, death, sickness, or deliver the people from threats or defeat and exile. Psalms 4 and 1 says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Psalms 6, 2 to 3, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Psalms 25, 16 to 20, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies, for there are many, and they hate me with violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. And the psalmists were able to go back and recall all the times that God proclaimed to be gracious. Come back to me. I am gracious. I am merciful. This is the character trait of God mentioned in moments where people have rebelled against God. And they go to him. And we do that, don't we? We rebel. And then we feel like we have to run and hide like Adam. Where are you, Adam? Oh, I hid because I heard you coming and I was afraid. But then Jesus comes as the new Adam. And he doesn't hide. He runs to the Father every time he's in trouble. Every time he feels like he needs God's help. He is the perfect example of don't be like the first Adam. Be like Jesus. Go to the Father for everything. And they're asking for God's favor despite the fact that they don't deserve it. In the Psalms, King David reflects on his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. He is not deserving of God's favor, but he requests it anyways. And God is generous, and he allows him to remain as king. But he does hand him over to the consequences of his poor decision, which then kind of trickles down his family some. But any time that you turn back, all you have to do is turn back. God will welcome you with loving arms. Psalms 51 and 1, be gracious to me according to your love, according to your love. Be gracious to me. According to your compassion, blot out my transgressions. In King Solomon's prayer of the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, he anticipates all the disaster that could happen to Israel when they abandon God. He knows, like, if we turn our backs on God, it's not going to be a pretty story. But after Israel have broken the covenant and are sitting in Babylonian exile because every time they left God, they ended up in exile. Note to self. They pull from these stories that they've heard over and over of Moses and David and Solomon, and they ask God to give them the gift of forgiveness, the gift of favor and grace. Psalms 103, 8 to 11 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loyal love. He will not always strive with us nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loyal love towards those who fear him. That is so encouraging. Psalms 130, 1-5, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my request for favor. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in this word, in his word, I do hope. Nehemiah, one of the Old Testament prophets, describes God's act of grace and favor despite the rebellion at Mount Sinai and in the wilderness. Then he asked God to renew and continue that grace and favor by restoring his people back uh, out of Babylonian exile. We see that in Nehemiah chapter 9. Daniel is also in exile, and he is in Babylon confessing the sins of the people and requesting favor and grace. So like, hey God, if you did it for these guys back here, if you did it for our ancestors, we're going we're gonna to try this thing. We're going to ask you for this gift. 
And God, um, God ultimately restores Jerusalem and shows Daniel the, this vision of Jerusalem's ultimate rest- restoration after God's plan has come to, their, to completion. So the prophets ask God to favor his people. And they speak of God's promises to show favor and grace to his people after exile. And God promises to show this generous favor by the evidence of res- restoring Jerusalem and the land, um, the land's abundance. In Isaiah 30, 18 to 19, it says, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. When I was reading that, I started tearing up. Because the Lord waits to be gracious to you. He doesn't even wait for you to ask. He's just waiting for you to come. He's not going to decide to give it to you if you ask. He waits to be gracious to you. I'm waiting for you. Come home. And therefore, he exalts himself to show compassion to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. For a people shall dwell in Zion and Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. As soon as he hears it, he answers you. Zechariah 12 and 10, I will pour out on the Lord, or sorry, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as they one mourns for their only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. I hope you see Jesus in this verse. God Almighty saying they will look on me, the one that they pierced. And this is a picture of God's generous favor given to people regardless of their status or their worth and despite the fact that they deserve justice, that we deserve justice rather than a gift. When Jewish scholars translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, they used a variety of Greek words in the Septuagint meaning to show mercy or to show compassion. And this is the character trait of God that is embodied in Jesus. When Jesus' first followers look back at his life, death, and resurrection, they use the vocabulary of grace and gift to describe it. John recreates the messianic, a messianic version of Exodus 34 and 6 by reconfiguring the theme of Exodus chapters 19 all the way through 40. He recalls all of this, and he says, sorry, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace. And the word that he uses there is charis, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14 to 17, for, his, for of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. In the story of Jesus, God's gracious favor has become a person. (coughs) The ultimate gift of God's generous love was given without regard to our status or our worth. And even more, it's given to those who are unworthy of this gift. Paul is very aware of this mismatch between his worth and the gift of God's grace shown to him through Jesus. In 1 Timothy... 1, 13 to 14, it says, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, <coughs> yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which was found in Christ Jesus. So he lists all the things of why he would be super undeserving. But yet his grace was more abundant. And Paul describes um, humanity as we saw in the living in the video as the living dead, captivated by the powers of death and selfishness and sin, but God is rich in mercy and love. He has given life to the dead through Jesus as a display of the surpassing abundance of his favor and his grace shown to us through the Messiah. And Paul calls this the gift of God, not as a result of anything you do. You can't be good enough, can't get good enough to deserve this grace. He just gives it to you because he wants to. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, and I am almost finished. 
As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by his grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages that we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus, for it is by grace you have been saved. It is the gift of God, not by works, not that one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So you don't do good to get God's favor. But because of God's favor, we do good. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And last verse, 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And in conclusion, God's grace is an inseparable part of who he is. You cannot separate him from this love. The Bible is full of language pointing towards God's generous gift towards those who are undeserving. We see this language frequently in the New Testament as well. And as the apostles and the early Christians saw Jesus as God's generous spirit become human. And then to learn more about this verse, whenever I teach next, which is I don't know, um, we'll continue in this series and we'll talk about how he's slow to anger. Thank you so much for being so attentive and for being here. Um, Our next service is at 11 o'clock where we all come together. If you have children downstairs... You can go get them anytime. So let's just pray. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your compassion. It means so much more when we stop and look at how merciful you truly are. Lord, your ways are above our ways. Your thoughts are above our thoughts. Your love is unconditional. And your grace is a gift that you keep giving even when we don't deserve it. Lord, we are humbled and so thankful for your goodness and your love. Lord, thank you doesn't really seem like enough but it's what we have. And so we tell you, we lift up our hands, God, and say, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We give you our gratitude today, Lord. We ask that you would bless the following service, anoint Brother Cody Carroll as he preaches the word, and help all of us to feel your presence today, and let your word go with us everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen.